Now then, hello folks and welcome back to my video gaming channel. Today we're talking about the Papa of Platform Games Manic Miner. Manic Miner is a platform game originally written for the ZX Spectrum by Matthew Smith. It was published by Bugbite in 1983, then later the same year by Software Projects. This is the first game in the Miner Willis series. The design of the game was inspired by Miner 2049er, which is a 1982 Atari 8-bit game. Manic Miner was then followed up a year later with Jet Set Willy, such a great game. Then there was Jet Set Willy 2, a game I've not really played much of. Another game in this series was The Perils of Willy, which was released solely for the Vic 20. Andrew's Night Off was published as a type-in listing in June 1984 issue of Computer and Video Games. In addition, there's been quite a few unofficial sequels, remakes, homages and updates which have been released, of which some we're going to discuss in this video. For me, Manic Miner is one of the most influential platform games of all time and I don't think you can call yourself a true retro gamer unless you've played this game. Therefore, today I wanted to play homage to Manic Miner by exploring all the numerous ports officially released. Let's start by looking at the ZX Spectrum game. I remember playing this game way back in 1983 for the first time as a 13 year old kid. I was immediately impressed with the sound, music and colourful graphics. I never really thought that you could actually get a game working on the ZX Spectrum like this. It really, really did impress me and I thought the way in which that little fella moved and jumped across the screen was just brilliant. Anyway, so what's the story of Manic Miner? What's the plot of the game? Well, while prospecting, Miner Willy stumbles on an old, long forgotten mineshaft. On further exploration, he finds evidence of a superior lost civilization, as you do. These ancients use robots to dig deep into the Earth's core to supply the essential raw materials for their advanced industry. Centuries of peace and prosperity passed until one day the civilization tore itself apart through war. It elapsed into a long dark age, abandoning its industry and machines. Nobody, however, thought to tell the mine robots to stop working. Through countless ages, they had steadily collected a huge stockpile of valuable metals and minerals. Miner Willie realises that he now can make his fortune by finding the underground store. So there you go, that's the story. The ZX Spectrum game comprises of 20 caverns, each one screen in size, with several flashing objects which the player must collect before Willy's oxygen supply runs out. Once the player has collected the objects in the cavern, they must then go to the now flashing portal, which will take them to the next cavern. The player must avoid enemies listed in the cassette inlay as poisonous pansies, spiders, slime and worst of all, manic mining robots which move along predefined paths at constant speeds. Willie can also be killed by falling too far, so players must time the position of jumps and other movements to prevent such falls or collisions with these nasty enemies. Extra lives are gained every 10,000 points and the game ends when the player has no lives left. And when the game is finished, the game restarts from the first level with no increase in difficulty. So that's my overall introduction to Manic Miner and a look at the original ZX Spectrum version of the game. Now let's continue our story by exploring all the other ports and versions of this game Manic Miner, eh? Okay, so the first port I want to talk about is the Commodore 64 version. Now, without upsetting anybody, I would say that the Commodore 64 is considered a more superior home computer when compared to the ZX Spectrum. 
So therefore the game does seem quite simple on the C64 with its monochrome sprites and relatively simple backgrounds that didn't really push the Commodore's multicolour capabilities. However, the Commodore 64 did have a higher horizontal resolution which was good. And the C64 players may also find the music being perhaps a little bit simplistic with nearly non-existent sound effects. However, the game is still Manic Minor and it plays good. The Amstrad version was effectively the same as the Spectrum version by Software Projects, with the exception of a few changes. For example, Eugene's Lair was renamed Eugene Was Here, and the layout of the final barrier was slightly different to the Spectrum version. Apart from that, it's much the same game, and it's good. The Dragon version also came out in 1984. The gameplay is very similar to the Spectrum version. The game was programmed by Roy Coates and it also had two extra rooms, giving a total of 22 altogether. You could also type in a cheat mode by typing in PP Penguin. And to retain the resolution of the original, the Dragon version used a P mode 4 in black and white mode. OK, the BBC Micro version was released in 1984. It is noticeable that the blue Danube that normally plays during the title screen is absent here, which is a bit of a shame really. And the BBC version does not have the solar power generator. Instead containing a completely different room called the Meteor Storm. This has the reflecting machines from the solar power generator, but there is no beam of light. Instead, it has meteorars which descend from the top of the screen and disintegrate when they hit platforms. Like the Skylabs in the Skylab Landing Bay. It also has force fields which turn on and off and the layout is completely different. Also, the very last screen, which is still called the final barrier, is complex and difficult, unlike the Spectrum version, which is considered to be fairly easy, and has a completely different layout. It also features the blinking force fields. The MSX version of Manic Miner was produced by Software Projects in 1984. 
It's a rare British MSX title written by Cameron Else. It's a fast and playable port of Manic Miner. Graphically, the MSX version is almost identical to the ZX Spectrum original, but with a slightly different colour palette. Where the MSX version does beat the original is in terms of frame rate and lack of slowdown. The extra power of the MSX delivers a speedy and responsive experience. For many, this is the best Manic Miner conversion, and is maybe even arguably the best out of them all. Okay, the Auric version which came out in 1985 was programmed by Stephen Green and instead of having 20 rooms, the Auric port had 32 rooms. Wow, that's quite impressive, isn't it? Now, there are mixed views about this game. It's important to say that the Auric one was my first home computer that I owned, so I do have fond memories of this game. However, comparing this port to the original ZX Spectrum, it does graphically appear inferior. I mean, it just looks so different. I mean, okay, the Auric does offer solid graphics animation with vibrant colours, and it's true to say that every level has great variants in colours and shapes compared to the Speccy and other ports. However, for me, I, I just prefer the ZX Spectrum look. Look, it's just my opinion, that's all I'm saying. However, to balance that, I would say the sound and music in the Auric port was good. In fact, the Auric version has better sound than the other 8-bit ports, I have to say. It does have the same tune by Edward Grieg as in the Spectrum original, but it is longer and it has two instrumental voices playing instead of the one doing just the brief melody. So overall I wish I had the look of the Specky but it does have better sound and of course the increased levels, let's not forget them. So let's have a look at some of these levels.
This Manic Miner game was ported for Czechoslovak computers PMD85 in 1985. The authors made it as accurate as they could. The most notable observation is the lack of colour and music. And as you can see from the game, it's only displayed in black and white. Again, this is purely down to the restrictions of the PMD85 hardware. And this game, it contained 22 levels, so let's just have a little look at the game. The Memotech MT6500 and MT6512 were a range of 8-bit Zilog Z80 based home computers released by the British company Memotech in 1983 and sold mainly in the UK, France, Germany and Scandinavia. Originally a manufacturer of memory add-ons for Sinclair machines, Memotech developed their own competing computer when it was perceived that expansion pack business would no longer be viable. The Memotech computers were considered powerful, 15% faster than the ZX Spectrum and Amstrad CPC and it also had fast bitmap and character based screens as well as hardware sprites 16 by 16 pixels. These specs were quite impressive for the time. It also had a very nice conversion of Mount Miner, let's have a look. There also exists a Manic Miner port for the rare 8-bit machine called the Tanting Einstein, which was programmed by Cameron Else. This version has 20 levels. However, there is one key difference in this version compared to the other ports and that is that this port has a proper ending. After collecting the last item and jumping to the exit, Miner Willy ascends up to the ground level and the game actually ends with a brief musical fanfare. I mean, I have to say I was always a little frustrated that there was no ending in the original. I mean, there was no reward or ending credit for actually finishing this difficult game. This was a nice touch while the original versions just restart from the central cavern again. So it was refreshing to see it in this port. Dearie me. The Commodore 16 version, which was released in 1986, was limited in a number of respects. 
This was mainly due to the initial lack of developer material for the C16 machine and a two week deadline to produce and test the game then generate a master tape for the duplication house. Other issues related to the lack of a fast loader system for the C16 cassette deck. As a result, it took about seven minutes for the game to load and a bug resulted in the game entering the first screen as soon as the tape had finished loading instead of waiting for the user to start the game. And as you can see from the video, there was further issues relating to the lack of music and in-game sound. And the way that the video memory was mapped in the C16, this resulted in a number of the screens having to be removed so that the load time and the video mapping could be correctly handled. This is certainly one of the weaker ports of Manic Miner. Okay, the Amiga version of Manic Miner is split into two versions. Firstly, we'll look at the direct clone of the original Commodore 64 8-bit game, and then we'll look at the 16-bit upgrade. Okay, now let's have a look at the upgrade. This features scrolling screens and colourful animated sprites in place of the single screen, single colour originals. As you would expect, the graphics are much more colourful and detailed, but they do seem to have lost much of the original charm along the way. I was also slightly disappointed with the music as well. However, nevertheless, despite all that, the old hair pulling out gameplay still remains. I still found the game very addictive. The Amiga upgrade is also significantly harder, with tighter time limits, slightly different alien attack patterns and the inability to see the whole carving. Therefore for me, playing the Commodore 64 version was quite useful with regards to getting practice in. Retro gamers like myself who liked the original may be tempted by this while younger players could yet be enthralled if they are prepared to accept the mediocre graphics and the limits of the still classic gameplay. Let's have a look at some more of the levels.
This is the Sam Coupe port of Manic Miner by Revelation. This version has been programmed by Matthew Holt with quality graphics and a really superb stereo soundtrack. For me it's probably one of the best versions as it's slightly faster than the ZX Spectrum. In addition to the original 20 caverns, 40 additional caverns have been included in this release. That's 60 levels. This is a cool part of the game, let's have a little look. Okay, Matt Smith's legendary game also found its way on the Game Boy Advance. The game was developed and published by Jester Interactive. The Game Boy Advance version of Manic Miner features two separate branches, the original game with the original 20 levels and the enhanced game with 10 new levels mixed in with the old ones. Usually in Manic Miner the new or enhanced levels are not very good, but in this game it feels like they have been properly designed and playtested and offer plenty challenge and fun. I suppose the only downside is that they got rid of the iconic Monty Python style game over boot and replaced it with a crappy p-rendered animation. It's fair to say that Manic Miner for the Game Boy Advance is graphically more sophisticated. This is definitely a reinvention, but it remains faithful to the original version, I have to say that also. The game has good originality and it comes with an advanced graphical and aura makeover. This port is definitely worth a try. There was also a 2003 Manic Miner port on the Java Mobile. I haven't actually played this game but it doesn't look particularly good. It doesn't really capture the spirit of the game. Perhaps you could let me know if you own this game and what do you think of it. Thank <laughs> you. 
Czech programmer Alice Martinik performed it almost unthinkable by porting Manic Miner to the ZX81. Ultimately, nine of the original Manic Miner screens had to be dropped in the ZX81 port, leaving 11 screens to play through. But it does seem that the most familiar ones have been maintained, including at least Central Cavern and Eugene's Lair. The room names have been translated into Czech in this version. I have no doubt that if this port were thought possible in the day, the ZX81 could have enjoyed a commercial release, but it seems to me that the pseudo high res mode of the ZX81 was not fully exploited until a few years later after the ZX Spectrum had already taken off, unfortunately limiting its utilisation to a relatively small number of titles. Fast forward to 2003 and ZX81 and specky public domain developer Russell Marks takes the ZX81 version and ports it into the ZX Spectrum 128K and it's pretty much similar to the ZX81 port. As for the gameplay itself, the collision detection is a bit strange and this does make the game more difficult than the original specky version. Not sure, perhaps that's a good thing if you want a more challenging port of Manic Miner. Manic Miner The Lost Levels is a collaborative project by coders Headsoft and journalist and video game historian Stuart Campbell, which came about after the latter wrote an article in Retro Gamer magazine about the missing Manic Miner levels. The short of it is that these various levels, 50 in total, were hunted down, documented and then used to create a whole new Manic Miner game for the Nintendo DS with tarted up modern graphics and sound. As already mentioned, the game features a total of 50 stages, arranged in three sections. The Lost Levels are 20 stages taken from the genuine Manic Miner ports. They're levels which didn't appear in the original ZX Spectrum version of the game, but were added to subsequent official ports for such platforms as the Auric, BBC Micro, Dragon32, Amstrad CPC and Game Boy Advance, sometimes as additions to existing levels and sometimes as replacements. The Willywood levels are unlocked on completion of the Lost Levels. Willywood is a standalone 10 level game featuring original stages designed by the authors of this game. And then finally there are the bonus stages. These 20 bonus stages are a mixture of original levels and classic levels from both Manic Miner and other related games. They're played for speed rather than points, each keeps a record of your fastest time and are unlocked one at a time by finding secret areas in the stages of the Lost Levels and Willywood. If a level had a secret area to find, a small seal will appear at the top right corner of the descriptive scroll which occupies the DS second screen. On finding the area, a new bonus level will be unlocked. You don't have to complete the level after finding the secret area, just getting there is enough. The Xbox 360 Manic Miner port is not a remake, but a recreation of the original ZX Spectrum game from 1983, complete with fake scan lines and a very 80s looking TV bordering the action, although you can play it in full screen as you can see here. This game was published by Elite on the 21st of June 2012 and is pretty good, worth checking out.
Well, there you go, that was my Manic Miner ports, including the odd homebrew version as well. Manic Miner is the grandfather of pure platform perfection that has been mimicked, copied, but never bettered. A landmark title that made Matthew Smith an overnight star. Matthew is a legend in his own right too, and I wanted to share a small clip taken from a Channel 4 documentary in 2000 called Thumb Candy, where Ian Lee interviewed Matthew Smith. Brilliant viewing. Manic Miner was Britain's first software blockbuster. You played Miner Willy, who had to jump his way through 20 screens of platforms collecting treasure, all to a continuous soundtrack, which had previously been thought impossible to do on the Sinclair machine. It also had a very British sense of humour. When you died, a Python-esque foot descended to crush the hapless miner. As if that weren't daunting enough, there are also mutant jellyfish and flying lavatories to contend with. And here's Matthew Smith. Matthew, how on earth do you come to write a programme like Manic Miner? I do shut myself away for a while to actually get the programme written. Matthew Smith became very wealthy very quickly with the success of Manic Miner and its sequel, Jet Set Willy. But then he disappeared. He stopped writing games and he vanished into video game myth. Uh, for the past few years, there's been a website up called Where Is Matthew Smith? And people have been calling in sightings. According to some rumours, he was planting tulips in Amsterdam. Other people claim to have heard, heard him calling in on radio talk shows or seeing him in the local supermarket. I think it's going to get to a stage where one person can't write a whole game. I was 17 when I wrote Manic Mind. From start to finish, uh, from I was in Italy writing, drawing pictures of some levels with some water running down. And I came back and in eight weeks we were duplicating cassettes. I had um, a Tandy TRS-80, but it crashed every time anybody put the kettle on, so I had to work at night. Uh, my favourite monster in Manic Miner. Um, I, I got the most compliments on the telephones. The... There was a game in an Atari written by an American called Bill Hogue. He was uh, very much an inspiration. The game he wrote was Miner 2049er, which was a little man jumping around on platforms, collecting things and avoiding the baddies. <laughs> Sounds like a winner, I like it. All right, Matt, we're here. We've got a Spectrum. Right, well, let's load up Manic Miner, the game that you obviously wrote. Uh, these, I, the Spectrum keys confuse me because it's got the words on there. This is load. Nice symbol shift. I made the first screen fairly hard just so a stranger to it could enjoy a lot of the frustration without having to get very good at it. It, it, ah. is, it is. A simple mistake like that is enough to end it all. Where did the boot come from that kills you at the end? That all Uses, loses your chance. Um, out of the top of the screen. <laughs> well, that's no fair to you. Manic Miner, this is the first game. Jet Set Willy sort of is the sequel to it, isn't it? It's the same character and stuff. How long did that take to... Oh, to that... It was a slog getting Jet Set Willy finished. Were they really pressuring you to come up with, with the, the next big hit? Were you getting people phoning you up saying, come on, Matt, you've yeah, got to do this? Yeah, the assumption was it's once you do one in a certain time, you can keep doing it in the same time. Every Spectrum owner eagerly awaited the final release of the trilogy, the now legendary Minor Willy Meets the Tax Man. Wasn't there supposed to be a third one? Jet Set Willy Meets the Tax Man or something? Uh, yeah. Well, what happened to that? Is that...? Uh, the Tax Man was way at the back of the queue there. Oh, really? <laughs> well, that being rude, how much did you make from Manic Miner? I did have a substantial sum, but I expected a whole lot more, mm. so I spent what I had. You, fairly foolishly. You are the stuff of legend. You are a legend. There's no doubt about it. In this sort of world, you are. Can I run past some rumours that are on the net about you? And you can just say, tell us if it's true or if it's false. Um, you lived in Holland in a commune. This is, yeah. What, when did that happen? That was a great time. Uh, I went there in 1995. OK, you worked as a fish seller. Uh, no, I don't think I ever sold fish. I tried to get a job in a fish gutting factory, <laughs> uh, but I applied at the wrong time of year. What does it feel like to, like to know there are you know sort of a lot of people interested in what you're doing now? Twenty, you know, twenty years after you wrote this. Well, everything comes around and goes around. Uh, like five years after I did it, I was a washout 
and uh, 10 years after I did it, I was history, but coming up to 20 years now, and I'm a legend. <laughs> Okay folks, that was my video covering Manic Miner, a game that earns its place as one of the finest retro games ever. I hope you found this video entertaining. As always, I would appreciate a like, share or comment. However, I really appreciate anybody that subscribes to my channel. And thank you if you've already done this. Thank you very much. Until my next video, see you all very soon. Take care everybody. Bye bye.